I'm going to start a little mm -hmm. bit about when fear turns to faith. I want to show this picture. I'm hoping that the light doesn't go off. Do you see that? You see what's going on? Mm. Up there. Oh. Mm -hmm. There she is climbing. There she is climbing. Mm -hmm. Back in graduate school, I thought I'd get some outdoor time, and I registered for a workshop in rock climbing. I got to realize I lived in Arizona in the south, but there's all uh. kinds of wonderful rock outcroppings and places to climb, and they're pretty cool. <clears throat> Little did I know that rock climbing is really cliff climbing. And in spite of the fact that there were three or four backup systems, just in case the primary ropes failed, and we were securely in harnesses and on belay, my knees and legs were like jello. Literally, I couldn't start the first climb because my legs would not work. Never before nor since have my legs behaved that way. <laughs> it was some time before I realized that we were safe and could focus on the climb because we were in harnesses and on belay. You know what on belay is? Okay, there she is, and you see there's, you may see there's ropes going up and there's ropes going down, and there's this person at the bottom watching the climb and controlling the ropes so that if she starts to fall, they put pressure and she can't actually fall. Even if she loses and comes off the cliff, she's still right there and can get back on and keep climbing. She can't actually fall and harm herself when she's on belay. In fact, they instructed us when we got up a little mm -hmm. to intentionally fall back so we'd feel mm -hmm. that belay and then we could stop worrying about it. Mm -hmm. it um, Living in the human realm is a bit like rock climbing. If the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have you on belay, then you can focus on the climb. And this is refuge. Mm -hmm. This is when fear turns to faith. Just an example. Nice. So, I want to give you another example. I have to go from one place to another in here. I want to give you... Um, Another example, and again, it's a story, and it's something that happened to me. It's how I learned about refuge, and I call it refuge through Western eyes, and I'm just going to read a part of it. The first part's called the nursery. When Rinpoche gives refuge for the first time, especially in a private um, a private appointment, but even in a group setting, if she knows she's giving refuge for the first time to a lot of people, there's a particular refuge formula that she uses. And it says, with discrimination. I go for refuge seeking freedom. I offer all that I was, am, and will be for the result that will not decay. I take responsibilities for my actions from now on and take great joy in joining the family of the Buddha. I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. As Trini said, one begins the Buddhist path by taking refuge. And those in this room all know we all begin every practice by taking refuge. We begin teachings by taking refuge. We can actually take refuge any time during the day or night when we feel the need, such as Trini <laughs> illustrated. <laughs> refuge is a basic practice among Buddhists, and individuals from Buddhist nations, whether they're Buddhist or not, have a basic understanding of what that means. But in the West, we have a bit of a challenge because it, it, it's not something that's in our consciousness. It's not in our culture. Gaining an understanding of refuge really doesn't end. There's the outer fact of taking refuge, and you know, we all learn the words and, and how to do the different kinds of prostrations. Um, but I have a Buddhist friend who, um, who was also raised Christian, has practiced Buddhism for another, a number of years. Not Tibetan Buddhism necessarily, but what she calls American Buddhism. And she's never formally taken refuge. She doesn't understand it, 
to her, it's a meaningless outer ceremony. So it was never explained to her, and she never grasped the importance of taking refuge. I didn't understand refuge until I began to experience healing on the inside. And this was within the first weeks after becoming a student and doing my practice. It was a healing so deep that it relieved suffering. I wasn't even aware was present until it was gone. It's difficult to explain how you don't notice something, especially suffering, but it's sort of like we talk about people who have chronic pain they eventually usually develop a very high threshold of pain and they can live in chronic pain and hardly notice it unless it spikes very high. They just, they, they adapt, they stop paying attention. They have to in order to be able to function. And in a way, we have experienced this pain, this inner pain or fear or lack of safety for so long, we don't even realize it's there until it gets triggered. And or until suddenly it's gone. And it was like this morning, you noticed that the sky was gray this morning, and then maybe an hour or so ago, the sun started to come out, and it was like, wow, it's really pretty out there. <laughs> I don't know if anyone saw that, looked out the window, I see blue sky, it's really pretty yeah. out there. And there's that ah feeling. And that is when you realize that well, things are better, mm -hmm. and there is refuge. Um, it feels so good when this basic level of suffering is gone. You'd be amazed how quickly you can adapt. Of course, the thing is you do adapt, and then that becomes your new baseline, and then other things begin to, you notice sufferings, and other things bother you. And so this is sort of the layering pulling off layers and layers and layers. And as you pull off layers of needing to progress in the path, you have to go into deeper and deeper levels of understanding refuge. Um, so I developed two allegories for refuge. The first one came to me in February 2004, and I'd been a student of Rinpoche's just a little over three months, but trying to explain to people who didn't understand what it was like to find this teacher. Now, mind you, not only had I not been Tibetan Buddhist, I hadn't been Buddhist. I wasn't even interested in <laughs> Buddhism. I didn't have any great feelings of familiarity when I saw images of the Buddha. I thought His Holiness the Dalai Lama was this nice little guy who was, was very sweet and walked around in robes and said, pithy things. I mean, we're talking clueless here. <laughs> I've been going through life the best I knew how. Always had a spiritual bent. Always. from Before I can remember. I wanted something marvelous, but I didn't know how or what. I didn't know where to find it. I searched many avenues, and like all other sentient beings, I'd been suffering. Most other sentient beings were suffering even more than I. I am, after all, an American, and our suffering is pretty minor compared to many of the other sentient beings in this world. But face it, we suffer many things. We know this by our own experience of suffering. This is samsara. It's the state of being unenlightened. It's a state of suffering. It often, in our country, will revolve around dissatisfaction, irritability, wanting more, feelings of something being unfair, life is unfair or someone is unfair to us, or it's inconvenient, or we feel unloved or unlovable, or we lack inner peace. And just like Trini was saying, they don't understand me, they don't appreciate me, I try as hard as I can, yada, yada, yada. So her was going along blindly, and suddenly, out of the blue, at that time, both literally and figuratively, I was scooped right out of samsara by a family of enlightened beings. It happened so suddenly, I didn't even know at first that it had happened. They placed me gently in the Domo Geshe lineage enlightened beings nursery, where I was carefully watched over and lovingly guided and receiving a tailor-made education. 
Continuing with the allegory of being in a nursery, that meant I would learn to roll over, sit up, crawl, pull myself to a standing position, toddle, walk, run, and eventually skip and dance. And one day I will become an adult, which is a Buddha. But in the meantime, I was a new member of a loving and skillful family. I was finally safe. This was refuge. Am I still in some sorrow? Well, of course, here I am. But the change is so dramatic, it doesn't feel the same. I was rescued. That characteristic of refuge still holds true no matter how far in the refuge you go, and we hope everyone will go all the way, there's still this feeling of having been rescued. I don't think I'm in the crib anymore, and I, now I can toddle around and actually cause trouble. <laughs> So I guess I'm in my <laughs> So when you're looking at the beginning of the path, again, you're looking at refuge, being rescued, finding a place that's safe. And then you can start to work. Then there is another allegory of refuge. The refuge that Rinpoche gives us in English that we use at the beginning of all of our um, most all of our practices is in order to obtain perfect enlightenment. Well, we're going for something different. We have a different goal. In order to obtain perfect enlightenment, I vow from now on to go for refuge to the Guru and three precious gems and not abandon sentient beings. I will practice the six perfections. We've added another layer now. We're not just going for safety, we're going for development. And we're relying on the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha to support us in that development and keep us on belay. And then eventually, we're going to be doing it so that we can turn around and rescue all sentient beings. So, this is also an allegory, and please go with me on this journey. We're traveling through a wilderness. Well, you're traveling through a wilderness. We're all individually traveling through a wilderness. Many fellow travelers you've met on the road have grand ideas about how to find their way out of the wilderness. If you don't believe me, just read Facebook. <coughs> Some even claim to have maps or to have seen a map once that they can recall. But no one you know of has ever really found their way home. There are only the many fanciful tales that travelers tell each other when they manage to gather and share a meal before moving on. Night is falling and it's cold, sort of like Sunday night. Do you remember Sunday night? When we had the ice storm? Like that. A freezing rain has been coming down all afternoon. The path is muddy and rocky and it's getting dark. It's difficult to see your way forward. You've slipped and fallen so many times. Your clothes are stiff with half-frozen mud. Your arms and legs are scraped and bruised. Clearly, some of these scrapes will become infected, and you can already feel them throbbing painfully as you walk. There's no shelter and no warmth, and you have no choice but to walk on, hoping to find some place to duck out of the misery surrounding you tonight. That's a condition most of the people are in this world. In the near total darkness, you notice a large shape and wonder if you're near some outcropping of rock where you can find rough shelter, such as it may be, from the wind and sleet. As you approach, you discover that there's an opening, a cave. What a joyous find. You have found shelter. You enter the cave to duck out of the sleet and feel that it dis discover that it feels warm. Surely this is a figment of your imagination, fueled by the change in temperature, now that you no longer have to contend with the wind. But after a few moments, you realize it is indeed warm. You move further back into the cave and realize that you can see your way. It should be dark, but there seems to be an ambient light. So you go further and follow the light till you find a large opening with a fire blazing in the center and rocks and logs spaced around it for seating. Somewhere there must be people and you hope they will welcome a half-frozen, miserable traveler for the night around their warm fire. 
you remove your wet, muddy shoes and place them near the fire to dry. As you raise your head, you see a warm blanket has been placed nearby. You remove all your wet, dirty clothes, place them over various rocks to dry, and wrap up in the soft warmth of the blanket. And as you turn back to the fire, you see a cup of warm liquid and a bowl of stew. You have been cold, so cold you didn't realize how hungry and thirsty you were. Thankfully, eating and drinking, you pay scant attention to the room. And when you're done, you realize that a soft mat and warm bedding are lying nearby. There's also a bowl of warm water for washing your scrapes and some salve and bandages to apply them. How fortunate can one traveler be in so short a period of time? You lay down to sleep, and as you drift back and forth between dreaming and that twilight state between dreaming and wake, you notice there's some figure standing calmly, calmly looking toward the entrance of the cave. You know this is your benefactor, but you're too tired to move. As you observe this person, you wonder if she's watching the entrance to guard you from harm, or if she's watching the entrance to see if there's some other cold, weary traveler passing by who needs to be sheltered in the storm. Maybe it's both. Somehow, at this very moment, it doesn't matter. You're safe and warm and filled. In the morning, you wake and find there is a warm meal awaiting you. Even more amazing, you find that your clothes and shoes are actually clean and dry, as though they were never filthy and caked with frozen mud. And there is no trace on the rocky floor of the mud you must have tracked in last night. Most amazing, amazing of all, you yourself are clean as though you had showered. Your scrapes are almost completely healed. Not one is reddened or swollen, and not one throbs in pain. You quickly dress and see your benefactor standing near the doorway of the cave, dressed for traveling with a long walking stick and a pack of supplies. As you approach to offer thanks for the generous hospitality you've received, you were asked if you're ready to go yet. Are you ready to go? <laughs> you're going to be shown how to travel safely through this wilderness. You know the way out? Yes. Are you ready to go? Obviously, this person intends to accompany you for at least part of the journey. Knowing that this implies showing you where to find food and water, how to find shelter, how to avoid the dangers, you're unsure how far your friend will actually accompany you. A few hours, a few days. How long will you be my guide? Until you yourself have learned all you need to know to guide others through the wilderness and find their way home, is the reply. And this is refuge. From the moment you first spied that vague outline of a protective outcropping until you yourself become the guide, the entire experience is one of refuge. Once you're safe, you look around and consider all those who are not safe. Look at how they suffer, just as you suffered. The next layer of refuge involves the strong determination to rescue them, just as you've been rescued, but you need to be trained in how to do it and you'll need a guide for that training. So in the story, we see the fear, the escape from suffering. We see coming to have confidence that our needs will be provided for. And then confidence that the guide actually knows the way out. And then we find out it's also a training program so that we gain those same abilities. So we move for refuge from fear to refuge based on faith to refuge based on compassion. So there's another refuge formula that expresses this aspect. With a wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion, today in Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of awakening for all sentient beings, as long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain. Until then, may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. And that is a refuge formula that 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama always uses when he's giving bodhicitta vows. So when we're talking about refuge, and thinking about refuge, sometimes it's challenging to realize how, as Chinni said, it applies to everything, everything we do. We may not see through what we're doing to the fact that it's based on this refuge, that this is the foundation of all that we accomplish because there's so many aspects of the Dharma that we have to learn. We might think of refuge as being just like the beginning and so basic that, I don't know, we grow beyond it or some silly, silly idea like that. Yesterday on her Facebook page, Rinpoche posted something that said, dissolve all conflicts. Deeply forgive all who have hurt you and drop every pretension. If you can do this simultaneously, you will enter the state without foundation, the release from samsara, beyond the gate of revenge and pride is your true greatness. Now, that's a pretty big order. Dissolve all conflicts, deeply forgive all who have hurt you, and drop every pretension, and do it simultaneously. So I started to think about what that would look like, what that would feel like. So I'm going to take a few minutes and think, put yourself in the frame of mind, what would it feel like to dissolve all conflicts, deeply forgive everyone who's hurt you, and drop every pretension? What would that require? Trust. Safety. Safety. Trust and safety. Those things are our traumas we're hanging on to. Mm -hmm. The conflicts, the hurts, the pretensions. We're hanging on to them. So I thought about it and I responded and I said, when I really sit down and think about this, it seems that the primary reason we remain in samsara boils down to holding on to traumas. If we really let them go down to our core, healing all the suffering would begin to occur spontaneously and occur, continue uninterrupted, like pushing over the first domino. So why can't we let go of our traumas? Why do we hold on to them so tightly? this idea that they need to let go or they need to forgive. Um, but I think we often confuse um, I, I think we have some kind of cross wire that we don't actually let go or forgive. And I think it has to do with this feeling of safety. That when we feel safe, we don't feel like we have to be on guard anymore to protect ourselves from whatever situation got us into that trauma. And so we relax and we feel at ease. There's almost like a, a feeling of having a cushion, just a, like a natural mm -hmm. soft protection, I think. Right, right. And in that feeling of safety, then, then the traumas don't seem so... Important. Yeah. Or threatening. Yeah, or the potential, you know, I, at least from my experience, I don't feel like I'm waiting for another potential trauma. You're not, you're not looking for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. but, can can but you see how holding on to that, that lack of safety, holding on to that, literally inhibits your ability to progress in the path? Isn't that so? So what is it that we need to do in order to progress in the path? We go for refuge again, and again, and again. 
and again. Because without refuge, we don't feel the f- safety and the faith that allows us to progress. And even if we have this wonderful motivation to rescue all sentient beings, as soon as a sentient being hurts us, we recoil into a, into a position where we're incapable, incapable of opening up and being mm-hmm. warm-hearted and going out again. Yes? Mm-hmm. I, I've been thinking a lot about something that's very similar to this. And, um, it, you know, it's my experience. I'm going back to the things that Janine was saying about fear. <clears throat> it's really my experience that being afraid of not being safe, just being afraid that it won't resolve or not being there, just is the only thing that really stands in the way when I can relax and let go of that fear. It feels like the safety is like a natural place to be. It's only the anxiety that's mm-hmm. produced, which is why it resonated with me today. I've never heard it before even when it's been said that we have to deal with this fear first. You both said it in different ways. You quoted Rinpoche that we have to deal with this fear first or deal with the fear through refuge or through how we're going to cultivate that feeling of safety. Mm-hmm. And it, it does come down to mm-hmm. And as we move forward on the path, these fears will come back up again. Some old fear or some new fear will suddenly be right there in our face. And we need again to go for refuge. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so it's really interesting. Before I became Buddhist, actually for a few years, I mean, I, I, I meditated for a long time on my own. I didn't have a teacher for decades. And I taught myself to meditate and, um, you know, looked for teachers but never really found anyone that I felt could really be a source of refuge. Um, but in my meditation, in the meditation I had developed, so I kind of developed different ones over time, but for the year before I met Rinpoche in this meditation I had developed, I would invoke, I would surround myself with enlightened beings and I would beg them for help. <laughs> please guide me, please keep me safe, please guide me, please keep me safe, please show me what to do. <laughs> and. I didn't even know about refuge. I didn't even, I'd never really heard the word or studied it. I just knew that there was something greater than me that I, and I needed that guidance and that protect, that shelter and that, that wisdom. And that, um, and I really feel like doing that brought me to her. Like I was, you were calling, in fact, guided. You were calling the teacher from inside and you didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I will in just a minute, yeah, yeah. but what she said brought something to mind. Mm-hmm. In our culture, and, and Rinpoche has pointed this out, I'm sure you remember, individuality is so valued and overly emphasized that many, many people will say, don't trust anyone else, everything you need is within you, rely only on yourself. And if, in fact, you had already achieved Buddha, that would be a pretty good piece of advice. But since we haven't, we can't rely only on ourselves. We can have determination, but unless we're on belay, we can't climb with a feeling of confidence Mm -hmm. to, to face all the challenges and the difficulties of getting up that rock face. Yes, you can actually climb a vertical rock face. It's totally amazing. Until you do it, you don't realize that it's actually possible to climb a vertical rock face. God, I wouldn't want to do it unless I was on belay. No. (laughs) Because there's a lot of slips and trips on the way up. And that's basically what it's like. Imagine the safety of being able to fall back into refuge when there's a slip or a challenge. 
You're not going to fall down the cliff. You're on the lay. Mm -hmm. So for a moment, I'd like you to close your eyes and feel that. Feel that belay in your heart of refuge. It's holding you. How does that feel? There have been challenging times in my period of being a student. Sometimes I felt that I was going to fall right off the Enlightenment bus. And I would lay there and there was this energy holding my heart. And I knew the rest of me could be flapping all over the place. And I wasn't going anywhere because it was right there holding me. I'm not going to let this one get away. <laughs> <laughs> you had something that you wanted to say. Pema and then Jude Nain. Well, I'm just, I'm back. I'm back to, I mean, I've had, I've had difficulty in developing feelings of safety and feelings of safety interior. So this is a, a subject of, I've been challenged in the past, and so this is a subject of great interest to me, and I've certainly been hearing things, you know, I've changed, and I'm certainly hearing things differently and fresh in this conversation. But it's so, it's such a profound thing to realize, again, back to what Chani is saying, is that you can try to change things in your environment. Well, you didn't say it this way, but you can focus on things in your environment and want those to change. Or you can have this feeling of safety inside and you can go anywhere and do anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, suddenly what was fearful before simply becomes almost like a checking, you know. Is this, am I connected to my feelings? of safety and refuge. Oh, no, I feel fear. Well, this is the time to connect again and take refuge. Mm -hmm. Rather than I feel fear, I have to change or control the situation. Mm -hmm. But now I can, instead I have a different method, I can simply remember the and, sense of safety. And take refuge. You, you, can't, you can't make other human beings or other sentient beings behave. Trust me, I remain alert when it's icy on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I was really alert, alert taking refuge. <laughs> I think every refuge prayer there I but, cited. Yeah. But I don't feel like I have to escape or change or control things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Today. Oh, I haven't raised my hand before. Pardon? I was raising my hand before. Okay. You sure you weren't raising your hand on the inside? I'm sorry. I thought I thought you were. Like, you know, uh, uh, a funny story, and some of you may have read this on Facebook, but for posterity. Mm. So, I was on my way over to Chinese house on Monday night, and we're going to have dinner, and then we were going to work on this because, as you oh, see, we're a great story. We're doing this together, and I'm only a few blocks from her house, and a car. Hits me on the, on the side, on my side actually. Very nice man. Clearly, it was an unintentional accident, but, you know, it was a dangerous situation. And um, I'm sitting in the car, and at first I can't even get it to go into park. I can't get it out of drive to go into park. So I can't get out of the car. I just sit there with my foot on the brake. And I'm a little bit too shaken up until somebody comes and says, "Turn." Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I reach for my, my phone, and uh, I call 911. 
And knowing that this is the greater Madison area and whoever the 911 operator is needs to know which police department to put me in touch with, they need to know where I'm at. So I'm, I'm realizing this and I don't remember how they answered the phone, but someone answered the phone and I said, I'm in Verona and I've been in an accident. And the person on the other end of the line says, oh, would you like me to call Chani? And I'm like, how did the 911 operator know I was on my way to Chani's? How does the 911 operator know Chani? Chani's not even her ordinary name. I'm like, well, I'm on my way to Chani's. How do you know Chani? This is Condro. I dialed 911. My phone dialed Lotus Lake. I swear, I know how to dial 911. My phone downloaded mm. like, and so Condro called Trini, and she came over and got me. And Ricochet kept calling Trini with messages, do this or whatever. She was, you know, right there. I'm um, like, okay, that is a really smart phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I could think is, how do you spell refuge? Mm -hmm. So um, even when things happen, you know, there's that sense of refuge there, that sense of safety, having been protected. And, and it was very recent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I liked when you said that Chani, or Chani turned to the police officer and said, isn't it nice when people are this calm, or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever she said? Yeah, he couldn't believe it. He said, it doesn't usually go this well. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was really remarkable. The young man was so gentle in his spirit and very, you know... You know, clearly sad that he had hit Takeshin. Everyone right. was glad no one was hurt. <clears throat> right, his first mm. question, are you all right? Is anybody hurt? Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out we had the same insurance company, so I was on the phone to my agent, he was on the phone to his, and they needed information about the other person. <laughs> so at the same time, so we just traded phones. It was really funny. And then we traded phones back so that I could talk to his and he could talk to mine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a very, um, <clears throat> we moved through this with about as much ease as you can mm -hmm. imagine. Yeah, and I, there's one other point I wanted to make about refuge, if I could, that when we take refuge, that we're not taking refuge just for this life. That we're taking <coughs> refuge until we attain enlightenment. And so I am absolutely certain that this is not the first lifetime I have taken refuge. And that in fact, my refuge from previous lives even caused me to invoke the enlightened beings, to pray for guidance, to pray for a teacher. Um, you know, many years ago, I was driving my son to a daycare, coming down a Farley toward a, an intersection, and I had a green light. And on the inside, I heard red light, red light. I was seeing red light flashing. And I was confused because I saw a green light, but I was seeing, you know, hearing, stop, red light, red light. So I stopped. And a car came barreling through their red light and would have killed us. I'm certain of it. And I really believe that refuge I have held in my mind stream in previous lives has protected me and protects many students. You know, we, we know many students who've rolled their cars and come out without a scratch. You know, that people who take refuge, who find safety on the path, are protected. <coughs> but the safety is not just about, you know, you know, the safety of you know, our mind, but it's protecting us so that we can continue to practice because if you're practicing, you're valuable. Because Many living beings are suffering, and they are afraid, and you know. So this kind of other level. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now that said, I'm sure there's <clears throat> many living beings who, if they've taken refuge in the past, d don't have a connection to it, don't have a memory of it, don't have a feeling of connection to it, but are still afraid. And our compassion for them should allow us to help them find true sources of refuge, even if they're really struggling and really mm. seem awkward at it and, and new at it and 
like it's going to be a long, challenging road for them. Because any support we give them, if it moves them one millimeter closer to enlightenment, then we have, in fact, benefited others. So when we think of refuge, it goes all the way from the lowest hell realms to the gate of perfection. And where people are is where they are. We may not be able to help everyone, but we can hold for others that energetic knowing of refuge. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I hope that when we're challenged, when something arises and things will, we're not perfect yet, that we remember refuge. Even if we get through the situation and say, oops, dang it, that wasn't exactly the way I wanted to handle that. Mm -hmm. We can go back to our cushion or <clears throat> sit in our chair or wherever we are and remember refuge on the inside and go for refuge and take refuge and find that place of safety again and feel what you felt earlier when we were when we were feeling it and then step back out and then step back out anyone mm -hmm. else have any questions or anything they want to share mm -hmm. about your experiences of refuge what it's meant to you I've heard Rinpoche say in a teaching many years ago, and she's probably said it more than once, you can do refuge as a practice. You can do refuge as a practice. If things are really confusing and distressing for you, take off your mala and do refuge as a practice. Go for refuge to the guru, I go for refuge to the You can do refuge as a practice. Any of the refuge formulas. I like that one when I'm, when I'm in that situation. She said it many, many years ago. You can do refuge as a practice. And if you need it, don't be afraid to do refuge as a practice. Mm -hmm. And she said that our refuge prayer is actually a complete practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, we want to thank you all for joining us. Hope that this discussion mm -hmm. on refuge has been beneficial. Hope you're going to join us next month where Trini is going to give a wonderful presentation. That's next month, right? Mm. That she prepared to teach either in high school or middle school. Yeah, the middle school. That's an overview and introduction to Buddhism. So, so this is going to be a wonderful <laughs> o overview and introduction to Buddhism. Not only invite people, but please don't feel that because you're a student that you're not going to benefit. Because I think we're going to all benefit. Yes. I don't know who's on the phone, but could you do a little save the date uh, for Breathing Mindfully as well? Which is not part of this series, but is coming up the Joyful Path. Oh, okay. So is that May 4th? I think so. So, um, yeah, it's in early right? May, there's on the calendar at Joyful Path, I will be doing an all-day workshop on Grieving Mindfully, Living with Loss in a Busy World. Yeah. And um, we'll be really kind of learning skills for addressing, just understanding grief theory and process, but also how to use mindfulness practices to help with grief. So, and you might want to advance register for that. Yes, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. And Tixin, could you mention your aromatherapy workshop then? Yes, let me open. Later this month mm -hmm. is the first of a set of aromatherapy workshops that Diane Oman and I will be offering here at Joyful Path. And uh, it's going to be on Saturday, the 23rd, February 23rd, from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, this isn't one that's going to be on conference call. You have to actually be present. We'll be introducing essential oils, what they are, how to use them safely. And then we're going to introduce some specific essential oils, allow people to use them and experience them, have some fun with them. Um, there will be some oils here available for people who want to take some home, or for those who don't want to take some home or can't at the time, information on how to get them yourself. 
later on. And this will be the first of many workshops on aromatherapy we'll be doing as we introduce more oils. And after the introduction, we're going to be focusing on oils for use in cold and flu season. Not only to deal with some of the symptoms of cold and flu, but quite frankly, oils that you can use to prevent it from spreading. So um, it should be fun, and we just, a huge kit of brand new oils just arrived mm. this week, so we're, we're going to have to resist getting into all of that. We'll just <laughs> limit to the few we're going to cover. <laughs> okay. well, would you like to join us in dedication? May my capacity for compassion be infinite. I dedicate these efforts to complete and total enlightenment so that I may be a benefit to all sentient beings. May it be so.